Hello everyone, and welcome to After Alexander, episode 45, The Spurned Bride. Last time, we witnessed the marriage of Antiochus II and Berenike, as well as the possible rejection of Laodike I. Laodike moved to Anatolia with her sons, and Berenike lived in Antioch with the royal court, as well as with her newborn son, Antiochus the Younger. The Taurus Mountains now separated the two families. As we covered last time, there appears to be debate about whether Laodike was still married to Antiochus in my sources, and she is still noted as wed to the king in Babylonian records from 247 BCE. Either way, Laodike was not someone who would stand by idly in such a situation. So, today, let's explore the intrigue and political shifts that may or may not have taken place, and the uncertainties that go with them. The relationship between Laodike and Berenike, who likely never met, was strained. This was exacerbated by the birth of Berenike's son. As we covered last time, a royal baby was born to Antiochus II and Berenike of Egypt, and also called Antiochus. However, Antiochus II already had royal sons by his first marriage to Laodike. A quick side note is needed at this point. I mentioned in a previous episode that the children of Antiochus II by Laodike included a daughter called Apama. However, I later read that the name written down in Babylonian sources is Apamu, which could refer to either a boy or a girl. However, references to this child disappear immediately afterwards. Either way, there are at least two sons by Antiochus II and Laodike, Seleucus and Antiochus, the latter of whom I've been calling Hyrax to distinguish him from his father and his younger half-brother. Let's explore what some of my sources think the consequences of Antiochus the Younger arriving on the scene are. The Wikipedia articles for both Antiochus II and Berenike Phernophorus state that Antiochus II and Ptolemy II agreed that Antiochus's children by his second wife would inherit the throne. However, Granger points out that, although it is a speculated part of the deal, Ptolemy II couldn't exactly have pushed for this to be carried out. Antiochus II may have allowed it for this reason. Now, how old both rulers were at the time would have factored into this decision. After all, Ptolemy II was 55, and Antiochus was his junior by nearly two decades. This age difference allowed the assumption that Antiochus would outlive his Egyptian counterpart. It was virtually a done deal by this reckoning that Ptolemy's death would have come before a hypothetical half-Egyptian Seleucid prince had grown up. Conversely, sources such as Livius, the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and Edwin Bevan do not mention a succession agreement like this at all. Before this, Seleucus, the eldest son, would have been the undisputed successor to his father, although he wasn't made co-king like his uncle and grandfather had been previously. However, the birth of Antiochus the Younger sowed the seeds for trouble further down the line. It is at this point in the narrative that we have to say goodbye to someone who has been in our story for quite some time. In January 246 BCE, Ptolemy II died at the age of 63, and the throne passed to his eldest surviving son, Ptolemy III. The majority of my sources mention the 28th of January as the day of death, but I have also seen the 27th cited. Anyway, it's not Ptolemy's death itself that is important for our narrative, but what comes after. Once Ptolemy II was dead, Antiochus II went back to living with Laodike. Moreover, he rejected Berenike. What came next changed everything. While Antiochus was staying with Laodike in the beginning of July 246 BCE, or Year of the Greeks 66, as per what we discussed in episode 18, he suddenly died in Ephesus. The birth date we have previously ascribed to him would make him about 60 years old, and he had been king for about 15 years. In his final moments, he appears to have declared Seleucus as his heir, although Laodike's being nearby could have influenced this. Granger notes that Seleucus' succession was a foregone conclusion, and he was declared king by his mother. Antiochus II, meanwhile, was interred in the Belevi Mausoleum. 
Here again, we see a split in the sources about what exactly happened to cause Antiochus II's death. Rawlinson's 1869 history notes that Laodice was worried about Antiochus changing his mind and making Antiochus the Younger his successor, and killed him so the throne would pass to her son Seleucus. Poison is ascribed in several sources, and Bevan notes that Laodice poisoned Antiochus in order to advance the prospects of her sons, or at least that this is what people thought happened. However, there is an alternate viewpoint. According to Granger, people have suspected Laodice and poison were involved due to the supposed hostility within the Seleucid family, but that there isn't any proof for this. Antiochus II died in a port city on the Mediterranean in the middle of summer, hence meaning his death can be explained as his simply having been ill. As Ptolemy II had died some months earlier, the way was clear for another war for Syria. However, Antiochus II does not appear to have wanted one, and his illness could already have been underway at this point. Contrast this with Ptolemy III getting his military ready for a conflict. As we've seen, Seleucus II was declared king. However, once the news of her husband's death reached Berenike, she too acted to declare Antiochus the Younger king. The new reign therefore started with a situation not seen in previous Seleucid reigns, namely two simultaneous claims to the rightful kingship of the Seleucid Empire. Next time, however, will not be the moment where we press play on the events following Antiochus II's demise. Instead, we will recap his life and award him his 21st century epithet. In the meantime, thank you all for listening. Feel free to get in touch at the show's email address for any questions or comments. Until next time, have a great week everyone.